You're muted, Carol. <clears throat> Carol, you're muted. Nobody can hear you on Zoom. organization classified COVID-19 as a pandemic. The, change, the changing virus, a coronavirus is not anything new. Um, in accordance with the World Health Organization, coronavirus makes up a large family of viruses that can infect birds and mammals, including humans. These viruses several outbreaks around the world, including severe acute respiratory syndrome, otherwise known as SARS, the pandemic of 2002 and 2003, and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, otherwise known as MERS, outbreak in Korea in 2015. While some coronaviruses have caused devastating epidemics, COVID-19 is only the second coronavirus to be declared a pandemic, and most others cause only mild to moderate respiratory infections like the common cold. <laughs> A changing virus, what about COVID-19? It can cause severe pneumonia and death in humans. The pandemic has spread globally and has consequently resulted in 5.15 million US cases and at least 164,000 US deaths as of August 12th, 2020. Obviously the numbers have changed because it's a daily basis and I did not update it to reflect accurately today. I think it's around 180,000 deaths. Um, COVID-19 has become the fifth human coronavirus, and it is possible that this virus will continuously circulate in the human population in the future. The virus keeps mutating and evolving during the pandemic. They are currently working on um, uh, vaccines for these um, signs and symptoms. Due to the fact that COVID-19 is in near constant state of mutation, and the signs and symptoms have varied widely among age groups, health status, and regional locations. The elderly have suffered the most deaths attributed to COVID-19 with more than 80% of deaths reported to those in age greater than 65, equal to or greater than 65 years of age since February 1st, 2020. <laughs> that also population also has the most comorbidities than other um, younger populations. Um, signs and symptoms. I know in the beginning when the, the virus first came out, it was shortness of breath, fever, um, the signs and symptoms of um, coronavirus at this time, they have, the CDC has recognized other evolving symptoms. And currently right now, the typical symptoms of COVID-19 include fever of 100.4 Fahrenheit or greater, chills or shaking chills, cough, not due to other known causes such as chronic cough. A chronic cough could be caused from someone who has um, a, a respiratory um, illness or respiratory insufficiency such as asthma or um, they can also have um, a chronic cough from a medication, sometimes antihypertensive or hypertensives can cause you to have chronic coughs as well. Um, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, sore throat, new loss of taste and smell, headache when in combination with other symptoms, as many people have migraines or cyclical migraines, um, muscle aches or body aches, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, fatigue when in combination with other symptoms, nasal congestion or runny nose, not due to other known causes such as allergies um, when in combination with other symptoms. So individually, each one is not alone by itself would be a diagnosis of um, COVID that would have to be further vetted with a COVID test through your um, primary care physician. But some of those are symptoms that can be associated with COVID as well as other diseases such as flu-like symptoms, flu illnesses, influenza A, influenza B, strep, um, RSV, or other um, diseases that can cause these typical symptoms. Um, signs and symptoms of atypical and emergent symptoms in adults include confusion, cyanosis, dizziness, unable to breathe, loss of consciousness, chest pain, or weakness. These symptoms may be a result of decreased oxygen levels and or cardiovascular compromise, depending on the severity of your COVID-19. 
Um, people who are having difficulty breathing will often, often place themselves in the orthopnic position as shown here um, on the template. The person may or not be able or be aware that they are positioning themselves for maximum air exchange depending upon their experience with breathing difficulties. And I know some people have seen that. Sometimes you see athletes or runners when, they, when they've run, they bend over to catch their breath, they take in more air. That would be a similar position, bent over. They might not necessarily be at a desk, but they could be bent over with their hands on their knees, trying to take in more air because they're short of breath. Signs and symptoms of staff, what to ask yourself before coming to work. And this is also will pertain to children before they come and we'll be asking for parent involvement as well. In the vetting process, in the past 24 hours, have I had a temperature greater than 100.4 degrees or higher when taken by mouth, which would be an oral temperature. In the past 24 hours, any new uncontrolled coughing that causes difficulty breathing or for students with chronic allergic asthmatic cough, a change in their cough from baseline. That's a very important thing to know because not every cough is a sign or symptom of COVID-19. You have to go by baseline. A sore throat, diarrhea, vomiting, or abdominal pain, or new onset of severe headache, especially with a fever, or have I had close contact with an individual diagnosed of COVID-19? And a close contact would be mean you're living in the same household as the person who has tested positive for COVID-19, you're caring for a person who has tested positive for COVID-19, being within six feet or less of a person who has tested positive for COVID-19 for 15 minutes or coming in direct contact with secretions, example, sharing utensils, being coughed on, any oral sputum from a person who has tested positive for COVID-19 while that person is symptomatic. It's important, symptomatic. Um, and finally, has my doctor diagnosed me with COVID-19 or have I been recently tested? Has my doctor instructed me to self-isolate? If you answer yes to any of the questions, please, we are we asking you to not come to work or remain at home and follow up with your physician. COVID toes, um, basically our lesions as those pictured below that have been seen on fingers and toes of children diagnosed with multi-system inflammatory syndrome um, in children associated with COVID-19. Um, that is a um, outside, um, not always a normal um, response to COVID-19. It's more of a severe, it's a multi-system inflammatory where your body has an overreaction and becomes inflamed. And that has been associated with kids in COVID-19. Cyanosis of the fingers and lips. Cyanosis is the bluish discoloration of the skin resulting from poor circulation or inadequate oxygen of the blood. And you know, COVID is a respiratory disease. So obviously if you had pneumonia from COVID and respiratory ailing, then your oxygen level can be decreased where you would have bluish fingertips or um, lips. COVID transmission, which is droplets. COVID-19 is transmitted from person to person via infectious droplets. Humans distribute droplets into the air when breathing, talking, yawning, coughing, sneezing. Another human can inhale these droplets into their own body when they turn and breathe, talk, or yawn. This is how a lot of respiratory illnesses, such as the common cold and flu, is passed through droplets and through touching surfaces that somebody else has touched and you're not washing your hands and then touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. It may be possible that a person can get COVID-19 by touching surfaces or objects like a packaging container that has the virus on it and then touching their own mouth, nose, or possibly their eyes, but it is not thought to be the main way of transmission for this virus per the CDC. So the next slide is the transmission by your mouth. The mouth is the most likely the first thing you think of when thinking about catching an illness. The mouth is both an entry and exit point from the body. Viral particles are dispersed into the air when you breathe, talk, or yawn. High number of viral particles are dispersed into the air when you cough, screaming, yelling, party, crying, all of those things. So that's increasing your the force out. Viral particles are then taken into the body when you breathe, talk, yawn, or place infected objects or dirty hands into your mouth. So it's both ways. So the wearing of the, of the face mask helps in two ways. It helps by limiting the, the distance of the viral particles distributed from your mouth and nose when talking, breathing, yawning, coughing, and sneezing, and by reminding people to keep their hands away from their mouth and nose. Um, envelopes 
um, another point of contact. Um, they, it's been frequently overlooked as a vector for droplet transmissions. A lot of people lick the envelopes. A lot of now times the, are self-sealing. Um, but if you receive a sealed envelope, you might want to consider wearing gloves before opening and discard the envelope and wash your hands after handling the envelope. If you're sending something home for a student, use the envelope um, that can be um, tied closed or use the clasp to tape it to secure the envelope securely. Transmission through your nose. Your nose is also a portal of entry into your body. Viral particles can enter your body through your nose when you breathe or sniff. Your nose is also an exit portal um, for your, from your body and can transmit large number of viral particles when you sneeze. This is why it is important when we wear a face mask or cotton coverings to cover our nose in addition to our mouth. Avoid picking or rubbing your nose. Cover sneezes with a cloth or tissue. Wash your hands after sneezing. Avoid sniffing around others. Maintain as much distance as possible from others. And avoid contacts with others who appear sick, who are coughing and sneezing, unless you know that it's from an other known cause, such as asthma or seasonal allergies, or from a medication that they could be taking. Transmission in your eyes. So the, it's the T-zone, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Um, people forget about our, our, our eyes, um, but it is, an oral, it is a mucosa. Um, so while it is not the first thought on your mind, your eyes are a portal of entry into your body. Um, avoid touching your eyes throughout the day, whether you are wearing gloves or not. You must not touch your eyes or any part of your face. Be sure to wash your hands and use hand sanitizer. If you cannot wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. Currently, there is no evidence to suggest that contact lens wearers are more at risk for acquiring COVID-19 than eyeglass wearers, because people who use contacts usually wash their hands before they put in their contacts or take them out. Contact lens wearers should continue to practice the safe contact lens and hygiene habits to help prevent against transmission of any contact lens related infections, such as always washing your hands with soap and water before handling your lenses. People who are healthy can continue to wear and care for their contact lenses as prescribed by their eye care professional. And that is something if people wanted to, to discuss, they most certainly could. And if they wanted to change the glasses, that would be their choice. Transmission on hard surfaces. It may be possible that a person can get COVID-19 by touching a surface or object, like a packaging container that has a virus on it, or then touching their mouth, nose, or possibly their eyes. But this is not thought to be the main way the virus spreads. In the beginning, there was a lot of talk around packages, grocery shopping, wiping everything down, cleaning your surface. You have your dirty surface, you have your clean surface, you have a piece of tape as a divider. Um, there's, you know, it can be transmitted. However, they're saying that it's not the, the, um, the, the route that most of the COVID infections that they're seeing, it's mostly from the oral nose transmission because it's a droplet precaution. It's a droplet. So while touching hard surfaces has not been determined to be um, maybe the way COVID-19 spreads in the community, tests have shown COVID-19 viral particles to remain on various surfaces for up to 72 hours. It is important to clean and disinfect all surfaces before and after use immediately after the surface has exposure to the bodily fluids. And don't forget about doorknobs, faucets, and handles. So you know, package deliveries, you could leave them outside if you wanted to, wait 72 hours. The biggest thing I think coming in into buildings and when you're in schools and or restaurants, bathrooms, um, uh, grocery stores is really looking at what you're touching. And it's not so specifically what you're touching, it's about what you do after you touch those specific um, items. It's not, it's not touching your face. That's, that's the problem. It's, you can touch everything you want. You just have to wash your hands before you touch your face. That's the biggest way to prevent the spread of any infection, not alone COVID-19, but strep, pink eye, um, flu. So those are really, and those are high touch surfaces, doorknobs, faucets, and handles. And those are things that should be taken extra care in when we're cleaning. Um, the next slide is just viral particle disbursement, how far things go when you're sneezing, coughing, and talking. Um, other bodily fluids, it's not known yet whether or not non-respiratory bodily fluids from an infected person, including vomit, urine, breast milk, semen, can contain viable infectious, infectious COVID-19. 
Um, research does continue to determine the risk of transmission through exposure through non-respiratory bodily fluids. Some tests have been found non-viable COVID-19 particles in both urine and stool. Non-viable, non-viable would mean non-transmittable because it's not viable at that time. It doesn't mean it wasn't active at a point, but at this time it is important to treat all bodily fluids as potentially infectious and take the proper precautions when assisting students with, person, with personal care. So if you have your medical fragile students and your younger pre-K, K, or um, daycare students who have toileting needs, um, you know, they would have the appropriate PPE on. Obviously they would have a mask because they are less than six feet apart from somebody. And they would also be wearing and donning gloves at that time during that care. If there was something that, was, that could potentially cause or if the child was having um, an extreme amount of vomiting and diarrhea and there, it, would, it could potentially get that, then, then that's a time that they would probably don um, a PP, PPE um, gown at that time. Best practice suggests that all teachers and students should have a change of clothing accessible in school in the event that their clothing becomes soiled with bodily fluids. Anybody could throw up at any time. Should you have a change? I would encourage everyone to have a change. It's not it's not the standard guidance. It's an in addition to just as a safety measure that if you were to have soil clothing that you could change. Staff assisting students with person with personal care and or eating should also don protective disposable gowns or long sleeve button up and zippered coverings that can be removed when the task is completed. And that's also speaks to our medically fragile room or kids sometimes that have um, behaviors, they sometimes tend to spit. Um, that would be, or during mealtime, if they had a oral swallowing problem where they ended up sometimes aspirating and coughing, it might be a time that they would want to wear an additional layer. But for the most part, PPE is gloves and um, a mask, but during the more intimate times, you would want to wear um, a gown. Staying safe, PPE and more. Keeping your hands out of your mouth and nose and eyes. Keep your hands away from your face. Wear appropriate PPE, and we have a guide of when you should be wearing it. Do not come to work if you're sick. Do not reuse P disposable PPE. Do not rewear clothing or cotton face coverings until they have been laundered using um, hot water available. Everyone should be washing their ma masks when they go home every night. And maintain a healthy immune system, eating healthy, um, getting enough sleep and exercise. Have a change of clone available. Do not share utensils or drinks. Do not share food. And obviously change your PPE when it's soiled or between um, students. The next slide talks about protective equipment recommendations. Um, and this came out and it's just kind of an algorithm of when you would wear it based on what was happening in, um, in your particular classroom or venue that you were working in. Um, so really for the most part, um, everyone would be wearing a face cloth covering and um, in a classroom unless they were doing something different and depending on their classroom, what their classroom warranted for it. The next slide would be donning and doffing PPE, and that's a video of full PPE. I can show you how to um, put on gloves. Um, donning your gloves, you would have your set of gloves and anything that you needed, and you would go ahead and you would just put on your gloves as such. You'd wash your hands first, and you'd put on your gloves. You would take care of the student or whatever it is that you were doing and whatever it is that you were touching. People wear them in the grocery store all the time. And then I see them all reach in their purse and then they put on their glasses and then they touch their face. The gloves are no different than your hands and you're better and it gives you a false sense of security. And I can't reiterate that enough that gloves are purpose. The intended purpose is if you're going to be doing anything heavily soiled or you're coming in contact with blood or bodily fluids. If you're not coming in contact, close contact with blood or bodily fluids, then there really is no re need for you to use gloves because you're gonna be washing your hands anyway. If you so choose and needed to wear gloves, you would put your gloves on after you've washed your hands. After you've washed your hands, you put your gloves on, you're gonna remove your gloves. You're not just gonna reach underneath here like this and remove your gloves and touch your wrist because remember your gloves are dirty. So you're gonna pull from the center of your glove and you're gonna pull it off like that. Because now these are dirty and if I reached underneath my cuff, I would then have dirtied my hands. I'm then going to ball this up now my hand technically is clean because I haven't had anything on it and I'm gonna reach underneath the cuff because if I touch the outside of my glove, 
then I will be touching a dirty surface. I'm then going to pull it like this and I have it self-contained in its own garbage. I'm gonna discard it into the garbage and then I'm gonna wash my hands with soap and water for 20 to 30 seconds per the CDC guidelines. If you do not have the appropriate soap and water, then you would um, use hand sanitizer with at least with at least 60% um, alcohol base. And you would put one dollop, about a dime size on your hand and you would rub thoroughly all aspects of your hand until it was dry. First best choice though is hand washing with soap and water. Um, and for hand washing as a quick review, you go into the bathroom, kitchen, wherever you want to wash your hands, you're going to turn the water on using the faucet, you're going to find the temperature that you like, hot, cold, doesn't matter, indifferent, some say hot, some say cold, really it's about water and about scrubbing and creating friction, you're going to get your, after you get your hands wet, you're going to get some soap, you're going to scrub your hands, and you're going to do it for 20 to 30 seconds, you're going to do all aspects of your hands scrubbing over the sink, and you're going to keep your hands down when you rinse your hands off, once your hands are rinsed off, you're gonna grab your paper towel, you're gonna to dry your hands. Your water is still running because your faucets that you touched were dirty. So you'll continue to dry your hands with your paper towel. You can grab another paper towel, you can turn off your faucet and you can pull the handle with your paper towel and walk out the door. Your hands are clean. If you, if you, if you turn off the faucet with your clean hands and not the paper towel, you have just touched a dirty, item. So that's, that's the intent behind that. If you're not available for that, then hand sanitizing would be the next. Cleaning um, versus disinfecting. Cleaning refers to the removal of germs, dirt, and impurities from surfaces. It does not kill the germs, but it just removes them and it lowers their number and risk of spreading the infection. Disinfecting refers to the use of chemicals, for example, EPA registered disinfectants to kill germs on surfaces. This process does not necessarily clean dirty surfaces or remove germs, but by killing the germs on the surface after cleaning, it can further lower the risk of spreading the infection. And I know that they're working on the appropriate EPA, what we can use in schools that is effective for COVID-19. To ensure effective cleaning and disinfecting, always clean the surfaces with soap and water first then disinfect using a diluted bleach solution, alcohol solution with at least 70% alcohol or an approved EPA disinfectant for use against the virus that causes COVID-19. Cleaning first will allow a disinfecting product to work as it is intended to destroy the germs on the surface. Use all cleaning protocols in accordance with directions on the label. We never want to say, oh, let's use bleach and let's follow that by ammonia or let's use Windex and then we'll use bleach. All of, these, all of these cleaning products have labels on them and, and regulations that they're not to be intermixed because they can cause significant damage to your skin, eyes, nose, or your nares and mouth by inhaling if you're mixing chemicals. It's like science, it's like a lab, but we don't wanna try it. Um, so, um, and we have to follow the manufacturer's instruction in according for accordance with concentration application method and contact time for all cleaning and disinfecting. Some products that you put on, you can put on, but you have to let them dry for 10 minutes so they can't be used. So those are things that we have to consider. Surfaces and equipment must air dry after sanitizing or disinfecting. Do not wipe dry unless it is a product instruction. Carefully supervise, careful supervision is needed to ensure that children are not able to touch the surface until it is completely dry. Keep all chemicals out of reach of children, both during storage and in use. So um, let's see, um, cleaning general guidelines and cleaning and sanitizing and disinfecting. Programs must allow for these general guidelines for cleaning, sanitizing and disinfecting. Um, they intensify the program's routine cleaning, sanitation, disinfecting practices, paying extra attention to the frequently touched objects and surfaces, including doorknobs, bathrooms, sinks, keyboards, and um, banisters. When kids are walking downstairs, if, if we have schools with stairs or hallways that have ramps, the kids are gonna be using those um, items. Um, clean and disinfect toys, activity items, including sports, special camp activity equipment used by children more frequently than usual and take extra time to care to ensure that all objects that children could potentially put in their mouths are removed from circulation, clean and sanitized before another child is allowed to use them. 
And we all know our high schoolers probably aren't going to be putting toys in their mouth. However, they probably do put their pens and pencils in their mouth, but it's more for the younger kids, the pre-K one kindergartners and daycare um, that we have in some of the schools that that is something to be mindful of. While cleaning and disinfecting, staff must wear gloves as much as possible. Hand washing or use of an alcohol-based hand sanitizer after the procedure is always required, whether or not gloves are used, because you want to get rid of, of any um, disinfectants. And some disinfectants specifically say that you must wear gloves before applying them to surfaces. Um, cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting indoor areas. Programs must follow these guidelines for cleaning. Um, Books like other paper-based materials such as mail or envelopes are not considered a high risk for transmission and do not need additional cleaning or disinfection procedures. Programs should conduct regular inspection of disposable um, of books or other paper-based materials that have been heavily soiled or damaged. Machine washable cloth toys cannot be used at all. Um, or any kind of material book that has um, a texture to it. Paper is not an issue, um, but you, you know anything, you know, the touch books that have like the fur um, for the littles, you don't wanna do anything like that. Um, toys that children have placed in their mouths or are otherwise contaminated by body secretions or excretions must be set aside until they're cleaned by hand um, by a person wearing gloves, clean with water and detergent, rinse, sanitize with an EPA registered sanitizer and air dry or clean in a mechanical dishwasher. For electronics such as tablets, touch screens, keyboards, and remote controls, um, mouses, we want to remove any visible contamination at present. Um, consider putting um, a wipeable cover or electronic for on the electronics like um, a keypad cover, then those could come off for that class. You could wipe them down. They could stay dry. You put the new ones on for the next class. That's an option. You need to follow the manufacturer's instruction for cleaning and disinfecting of all equipment. If there is no guidance, um, use alcohol-based wipes or spray um, containing at least 70% alcohol with in accordance with the manufacturer's um, uh, directions and then dry the surface thoroughly or allow to air dry, providing cleaning materials for older children to clean their own electronics. And that is something that can be discussed as well. Um, iPads, Apple recommends using 70% isopropyl alcohol wipes or chlor Clorox dip disinfecting wipes. They can't be used together. It's either one or the other. Again, we'd be missing, mixing products. We'd want to gently wipe the hard non-pore surface of our Apple products, such as display, keyboards, and other exterior surfaces. Um, sounds simple, but there are caveats. We don't want to use bleach. Avoid getting moisture in any opening. Do not submerge any Apple products in the cleaning agents. And don't use disinfectants on fabrics or leather surfaces because that can take away. Um, when to wash your hands. This sounds trivial, um, but I think we've kind of gotten away from it. Um, we always want to wash our hands upon entry into and exit from a program space. After touching or cleaning surfaces that may be contaminated, when coming into the program space from outside activities, before or after eating, after sneezing, coughing, nose blowing, uh, before entering vehicles used for transportation, after toileting and diapering, medication, before handling food, um, we wanna continue hand washing after the administration of medication. Um, Basically, after using any shared equipment, toys, um, computers, keyboards, climbing walls, mouses, anything that's shared equipment will also need to be cleaned and disinfected at the time of use um, and before and after changing your gloves. How to wash your hands, I actually already demonstrated that, um, and that's a video. Hand sanitizer, washing is always the first best best preferred method of cleansing your hands for both staff and students. However, when a sink is not available, the use of hand sanitizer containing at least 60% alcohol is acceptable is an acceptable replacement. Hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol has been found to be less than 60% has, has been found to be ineffective on COVID-19 particles in addition to several other viral and bacterial particles. Hand sanitizer that contains um, HSCA is considered by the FDA to be an over-the-counter medication and thus no child can use HSCA without the written permission from a parent or guardian. All children must use HSCA in the presence of an adult. HSCA may not be taken by a student into the bathroom, hallway, or in any 
other area when an adult is not present, and children must be educated on the proper use of HSCA, including education and avoiding eyes, nose, and mouth while using HSCA, HSCA is on their skin. Schools that intend to use this must have a written physician's order on file um, for our school and in our nursing staff, we will have that. And I actually have already spoke, um, have spoken to Dr. Comer and we do have the existing um, order that we can use hand sanitizer of 6% alcohol. And again, that is a dime size drop, like basically one pump and you're gonna rub it into your hands or dry. There was a lot of concern before about that because kids would put it on their hands, their hands wouldn't be dry, then they put their hands in their mouth and then they're getting alcohol. And so that's really important for education purposes that the surface is dry because if it's not dry, it's not actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. If you're walking away from your hand sanitizer, shaking your hands, you're actually not, effect you're not using it effectively. Um, uh, and that's a video on that. Um, cleaning and disinfecting the bathroom, toilet protocols, staff must change students' clothing and their own clothing when soiled with secretions or bodily fluids. Students' soiled clothing must be bagged and then sent home, sealed in a plastic container or bag. So if you had a student who had an accident in the pre-K program or in, an, in another area, you would have to bag that clothing and then you would take that clothing bag and you could put it in another bag for an additional safety so that that can go in the child's backpack. Um, toileting and diaper areas, including tables, pails, countertops, toileting chairs, sinks, faucet, toilets, floors, etc., must be cleaned and disinfected after each use. Um, disinfect when students are not in the area. Surfaces should, should be dry by the time the next student uses the area. Toileting, diapering procedures, including extra COVID-19 steps, must be posted in the bathroom and changing areas, especially for the littles, for the pre-K, K, and the um, uh, daycare programs, med fragile, and things like that, where we have the potential for increased exposure. Um, and then disclaimer: now all of the information provided in this PowerPoint and webinar is from uh, is from the reference provided on the following slides as of June fifth. 15, 2020, the pandemic is ongoing with new findings occurring daily. The virus will most likely continue to mutate and may continue to produce new symptoms. This training is not claimed to be an all encompassing lesson on COVID-19 symptoms or its treatment. The best advice is always to consult with your physician for further instruction. And then those are the references. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much you. Uh, for your presentation. I think that, and a lot of useful information in there, obviously, some of it we probably all knew, some of it may be new to us. Um, but I think that, you know, if I was sitting at home watching this meeting or as a parent sitting here, you know, listening to your presentation, you know, my questions are less about, you know, when and how we wash hands and this, but more about, you know, what are we going to do when a student has symptoms in school. And I know that we have that multi-grade protocol yep. from the state, but I wonder if you could just give us a few minutes on, on that protocol, symptoms in school and isolation and, and the big points for that. So, um, yes. Um, that's a lot of information. It's overwhelming. I think there's a lot of people that are concerned about what it's going to look like when we walk back in the door. Um, I am a parent myself. I have four children, um, one 17 who is, um, going to Nauset. I have um, a 11 year old who's going to the charter school and I have two younger ones that are both in kindergarten and second grade at um, Stony Brook. They, um, they actually have underlying health issues, asthma, chronic respiratory, um, and I'm sending my children to school. I feel comfortable that's a personal choice for me and my, my husband. Um, but as, as the CDC guidelines based on the biggest mitigating factors that we can do to successfully return to school is to maintain our six feet of social distancing and wear a face covering a mask over our nose and mouth and wash our hands. Those are the biggest mitigating things that we can do to be successful to return to school. There's multiple layers that will happen. There, there is the guidelines that we have um, on reference for um, our medical waiting room and what that will look like. And when a child is say positive um, or symptomatic at school, then basically what would happen is if that student was symptomatic at school, we would get a phone call, the nurse would walk down. And as we're taking that child down to the medical waiting room, we would be triaging because we don't have a, we don't have a triage office because we are a 
healthy population in a school, not a hospital. So we would be triaging that student distance apart, walking them through, asking them the assessment, how long have you had a cough? When did it start? Have you had a fever? Have you had anyone with known that has been positive? Is anybody else at home sick? Have they been to the doctor? All of these questions. And then we would obviously um, take their temperature, get their oxygen saturation, listen to their lungs um, and decide before we got to the medical waiting room, would they go to the medical waiting room or would they go to the health office? So we would have two separate defined spaces, um, the medical waiting room, which is in the guidance from the July 22nd, which would be on page 10, I believe, that would state, and that would be the area which would be um, covered by somebody um, in that room so the students aren't alone because you never want anyone alone. And then they would be in there six feet apart and or in a separate room, depending on the office. And then if they were not, if we didn't feel based on their symptoms that it was um, potentially COVID, that it was something underlying because the student has a known history of asthma and allergies, then I would say, okay, let's go back to, and no fever, then I would say, let's go back to the health office. So we'll be running two different offices simultaneously because we still have to provide the children with vision, hearing, postural, um, height, weight, all of those um, state regulated and mandated guidelines that we have to um, report to the uh, mass DPH on, Department of Public Health. Um, so the protocols is basically the same for staff and students, depending on the scenario it is, and the guidance based on their symptoms is how we would end up triaging them home. And then based on the, um, the, the symptoms with the protocol, we would determine whether or not they go to the COVID or medical waiting room, or they go to the health office and then they were dismissed. And then once they're dismissed, they follow up with their physician. If the physician determines that they can come back to school, then they can return to school. If the physician feels that it's warranting a test, then they would go and get a COVID test that is um, because if they have insurance, it's paid for, it's a physician's order. They can go to a testing site. If the physician didn't feel that it was an, that it was necessary, that they felt that they didn't need a test, then obviously the family could decide to go get a COVID test and go through a drive-through like Carewell. Um, that would have to be paid for by themselves. But, the, um, but it would go by their physician's orders. Um, if the student was positive, um, then we would look back 48 hours of that um, where he was in the room or she. And, and that 48 hours, we'd say, okay, this is where he was. This is the cohort. And based on the cohort in a classroom, in a school setting, a close contact includes other students and staff who are within six feet of the student or staff for at least 10 to 15 minutes in a classroom, in other school space, on the bus, or in an extra kicker activity. Um, basically, every student and staff member in a self-contained classroom for an extended period of time is considered a cohort and would consider to be a close contact. And because we cannot guarantee that they have been or maintained at least six feet of social dis physical distancing of a person who tested positive. So positive students or the student in that classroom would not be allowed to come back to school until they've been, then, until they've been tested or elected instead to self-isolate for 14 days. The recommendation is, is if they are in that cohort and that student was tested positive, those kids and that teacher in that classroom would be the cohort, they would go out. And then what would happen is it's, four to, it's recommended to get the PCR test four to five days, which is the most accurate test, the PCR, that they would get um, tested four to five days after the exposure. And if they were negative, then they could return to school with a negative um, PCR. Or if they wanted to self-isolate for the 14 days, they most certainly could. If the individual that tested positive for COVID-19 self-isolates for 10 days minimum, and until at least three days have passed with no fever or with no fever and improvement of any other symptoms, they can return, or if the test is negative, the student can return automatically, but wearing a mask. So it depends. So that basically is the same scenario, whether it's on a bus in the classroom, um, depending on the cohort. And that's why the cohort, if you minimize the um, activity within the school and everybody has their pod or cohort, then if there is a situation where a student is positive or a staff member, you're only dismissing that group of kids and or teacher. So you're not disruptive to the entire rest of the school population, but to that to that pod, to that cohort. And Kristen, is the school nurse who trained the students 
tracks and that student goes home, he keeps track so they have a test in home and they first home and they have so what would happen is, is we have, um, I have a COVID illness um, daily report school um, log that we've printed out. And that person that's covering the medical waiting room, we would have the date, we'd have the initials, we would know as well. And that student goes home, we would follow up, but that is tracked by VNA. So when they go home and the doctor says, yes, you need a COVID test, that COVID test, they go get the COVID test, the results are processed, they get their results. Maven um, and the Cape Cod VNA is the one that actually does the contact tracing. Obviously, we would know if they're positive, we would get word, and then that cohort would be all go home from there, that group, or if it was a group on the bus, and then they would be dismissed, and we would wait, and they could wait four or five days to get tested, and or just wait 14 days to see if they have symptoms. The, the, um, the hope is, um, and the science behind it is that, yes, you've been exposed to a positive COVID student, or teacher, but you've had in place layers of, of mitigation, which includes the mask and hand washing and not touching your face, I reiterated that, that the hope is, is that not every, that not 14 kids in that classroom are gonna test positive for COVID because you've worn and you've done the mitigating things in place to be successful. Um, you know, we've seen it, we've seen it on the news, um, Chatham parties, nobody's wearing a mask. We've seen it, you know, hair salons where they were wearing a mask and they didn't give it to any, anybody else. They practiced the standard precautions, washing their hands between clients, and they also wore a mask and didn't touch their face. So that um, is all things that are, will help in the success um, and the success of not, you know, transmitting it to other people while in the classroom. And yes, they're going to take their masks off to eat their lunch, and they're going to take their mask breaks. But that, again, that's why everyone's sitting face forward. COVID is usually going forward. It doesn't expel out of your elbow and your arm and your back and your ear. You know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're being thoughtful. And yes, they're kids, but kids are remarkable and can and actually follow quite a few rules. <laughs> um, so hopefully with these things in place, we will we'll be successful. Which I think we can be. And you just mentioned, so the kids are going to be able to take their masks off mm -hmm. to eat and have masks, mm -hmm. but that's with using the shield. So the shields will be offered. Um, we felt as a district that the shields are um, are um, an additional layer. It's not something that has been endorsed by the CDC or the WHO or Mass DPH as an effective barrier. Um, to stopping the transmission of COVID. Um, the best is still a mask that's covering your nose and mouth. And now there's stuff out regarding the type of mask. However, the shield is an additional layer because it protects your eyes because not everybody wears glasses. And we talked about that in the presentation that your eyes, your nose and your mouth are all portals of entry. And yes, your nose and your mouth take in and expel. Your eyes don't expel unless you're crying, um, but they do take in. So if you're touching or somebody coughs on you and it goes in your eyes, that's a portal of entry. It's just reducing an additional entry to, the, to your human body is by wearing a, um, a, a, face, a face shield, not a mask. So we're offering them to everyone, but you're not recommending any policy of your students mm -hmm. wearing a shield all day? Mm -hmm. We don't have a policy on that at this point. I think it's been something that's discussed uh, what we want to do or whether or not it's up to a comfort level of the district and what they want to do. Um, it, 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 we, I don't think we've gotten that far. It, we just bought them just for an added layer. And yes, the kids can take their masks off. There is something there. I know other districts um, in the United States are putting up you know, three sides of plexiglass. Um, you know, you can do that as well, because now you're saying I'm going to take my mask off, but I still have three sides of plexiglass so that if I disperse or look right or look left, I'm not going to disperse any um, COVID. Because remember, not everybody that coughs or sneezes has COVID. So that's like, we can get, I, I don't want to get caught up that everything is COVID and that it's not. But I think in general, I think we have to look that this is overall a healthy population and Yes, they could have it, or it could be transmitted, or they could transmit it. But with the mitigating steps in place, 
of face coverings, such as masks, we're eliminating two large portals of entry and transmission, expelling and entrance of the, um, of, of the potential COVID or flu or strep or RSV, any of those things um, is helpful. So the, so the face shield, personally, my kids wore a face shield to ESY. I bought them, I had them decorate them. They wore their face shield, they wore their face mask just to get them used to it. I felt comfortable doing it. They started the beginning of the ESY without the face shield. I introduced it to them. Just say, hey, this is what we're gonna do today. It's helpful. It doesn't hurt anybody. And it, it just, it gave them an additional layer of protection. And also I felt it was comforting for the people that were educating my child. Right, because the teachers are obviously facing the students. So right. That, I mean, and there is that distance. That right, because they're gonna have that buffer, right. Right, it's an additional. I bought one for my husband. He's a fourth grade teacher. He, so I also just mentioned the type of mask, and we've been reading about two layer, three layer, right? Fabric, cloth, and right. Yep. So, yep, and there's nothing that has come out yet by the CDC or the WHO of what the standard is. They originally said a face covering of some sort. Now I know that districts are looking into the verbiage on that and are looking into saying the face covering is gonna to have to be, you know, two layers of cotton covering your nose and mouth. Whether the gator is something that we will um, shy away from or a bandana or something and basically say that, no, we're gonna be using face coverings, which is a mask of two layers of cotton then we can look at that. That has not been determined yet because the World Health Organiz Organization, CDC has not come out definitively and said that they are ineffective. Those studies I think was done by MIT or Harvard. I can't remember. Um, so, I, I mean, that's probably more to come on that. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for your presentation. It was, uh, every time something comes down the line, for us to look at it, get into more and more detail. Uh, has there been any research or uh, experiences recently on how long it takes for uh, children versus adults to pick up all these uh, habits and, and techniques for uh, mitigating uh, contact? Uh, I don't. I don't think that there is any research that I'm aware of that how how expeditiously a child learns to wash their hands or wear a face mask um, in certain situations. Um, you know, if you look at daycares um, that have been open since this time um, and they were there for frontline workers, um, the nurses, doctors, um, firefighters, all, everybody that had to go to work, um, they put in the mitigating factors and they have been successful. And I don't know to this date, if I believe any um, of those uh, daycares that were in place for the frontline workers have actually had to close due to an explosion of COVID either by staff or by students. Um, and we did run a successful daycare program this summer um, at Baker for four weeks and as well as our ESY in person for four weeks. And we did not have a single positive COVID case that I'm aware of or a student um, that had it or a staff member and they work on um, not looking at as um, mass breaks, but like almost like mass tolerance, helping the littles, the youngers, like the kindergartens, first graders wearing them and looking at it more of um, as a game and let's wear our masks for a few minutes and then take them off instead of coming, you know, wearing your mask for three hours and be like, oh, no, take it off, you know, just kind of making it more um, uh, palatable, palatable for them to accept. Um, that and the little kids are actually pretty remarkable in washing their hands. Um, daycares wash their hands frequently, nonstop, nonstop. Um, in most of those venues, and even when my kids, it was every time you walked in, the kids are washing their hands before lunch, after lunch, before recess, after recess, before going to circuit time. And I think that sometimes we've gotten away from that as you get older because you're like, ah, oh, my hands are clean. But you know, it's really kind of reinforcing back into that we really should be washing our hands much more frequently than we are, not just when they're visibly soiled or we took out the garbage or we petted a dog or something like that. That makes a lot of sense and that's reassuring because uh, 
I, in my college days, I worked as an hospital in, in an industrial hospital and there were precautions, but when something contagious came in, uh, there was a scramble and a fear. Years later, I'm working uh, locally, helping on a house for developing disabled adults, and one of them might have hepatitis or some. And there were, there were I recognized the procedures, but I also recognized an increase in diligence for really stopping the, the spread of easily airborne uh, viruses. I've certainly caught enough from my kids at school and grandkids and uh, doing organizations where you greet the people and shake hands, and then I'm laid up for a week. Uh, <laughs> so uh, fist bumps just don't quite cut it uh, that way. Right. Right, it's just, it's just kind of like, you know, when my sister's coming from out of town, they're from New York, Syracuse, New York, next thing you know, we're all sick. We're not used to their germs. They have like a different kind of cold. They have a different kind of flu. They have a different kind of, but it really reinforces us to get back to really what are we doing purposefully and being mindful about touching our face and washing our hands. You know, I, I work in a, I've worked in a hospital for many, many years and, you know, wore masks, gowns, gloves, Infectious disease, um, HIV, AIDS, C. difficile, all, all of those blood boards have been spit in the eye, everything. It comes down to washing our hands, wearing the appropriate PPE when we need to, and not touching our face. You know, I walk out of a hospital room and my nose itches, well, I gotta think about how I can't touch my face. You know, we're so used to touching, we inadvertently touch our face. I don't even know the number of times without us even realizing it. Yes, it wasn't until watching the video of the meeting that I realized how often that uh, I acquainted myself with myself. Right. Any right. other questions, Greg? Thank you very much. Yeah, just a couple of things to follow up. Uh, it is about creating a culture here. And um, so, as a firefighter EMT, I, I you know, have a lot of friends that, were, that are, are still firefighters. And uh, so, it, it is about creating that culture. But you mentioned, uh, the daycare program this summer. Uh, so there were no problems this summer at all? There no, and you haven't heard anything and I never heard anything. And I was talking to them all the time and Maria Lopes, who's the director of people services was over there, Carol Eichner and the St. Pierre. Like we all were very much involved in the programs because it was um, the first really um, program back in person since we closed on March 13th. And that was, we had like 80 people um, I, don't, I don't think it was that. It many. wasn't that many. We had our medically fragile. We had Wade, Matt, and then we had the daycare program. That, that was at the high school, and then we had our daycare program um, and ESY at um, Baker. So, so in creating that culture, we had to, we had to, you know, communicate with the parents, and, and that stuff is part of that yep. too. So yep. it's understandable to kind of build that up. So. Right. And, and, and it was successful. And you know, the Board of Health, I'll be walking through the buildings with the Board of Health this week on Thursday and Friday. I think Thursday is all the Yarmouth School, and on Friday is all the dentist schools um, to go through and just make sure that our spaces are appropriate. Um, we have the medical waiting room, and then we have the health office for um, the kids that don't have any um, health or COVID like symptoms so that we can be successful in screening because screening um, vision, hearing is just as important for kids to learn to read and write and learn um, that is regulated by the Mass Department of Public Health and for an education. Thank you, Brian Kelly. I just wanna thank you for your presentation. I think um, a lot of the stuff we should be doing anyway, maybe they, you know, on a regular basis and that's how you get the cold, that's how you get the flu, I mean, you know, just wake up with a flu one morning. Right. Gave, you know, it came into contact with somebody who had it. And, that, and that's how we've lived our lives up until this point, right. not doing those things. That's right. why people get sick. Right. Um, it feels to me like you have a great plan. The kids are going to be safe in the school. The staff are going to be safe in the school. And that's really what the folks want here. The kids are going to be safe in the school. Um, without question, I think you're 100% prepared for a cat catastrophe. Oh. Literally, that's what, I mean, everything you have, you have plan A, plan B, you know, this is what we do in this case, this is what we do in that case. Um, but I think it's important to reiterate to the folks from last meeting, at our, last week at our meeting, if you checked our town, the Armist Town website, there were three people in town that had COVID-19, right. according to the town meeting. Right. Today, there's zero. Right. And there's only one person in Cape Cod Hospital 
right, right now or suspected of that. It's not right. clear according to the state website. Unfortunately, they eliminated the, the Baltimore County data um, in their latest round, so we can't check on that. But, um, but we do have the data from um, mass.gov that you can look at the dashboard. That right, they'll look better today. I, mean, I don't know if they changed it, but they took out Baltimore County. They something. take out, and it's going to be that by town weekly, it's going to be updated. And that's why Baker, uh, Governor Baker also put out the map. Um, uh, what so it's important people to know that we have a great plan in place. And there's nobody in our town currently sick that we know, that we know. which is about as good as you can get. Right. You can't get safer than nobody being sick right. that we know of. Right. And you can't get it from somebody that is not sick. Right. You have to be symptomatic. Right. You have to have a symptom. You have to be coughing or sneezing. You have to have any symptomatic person. And you, have, you, have, symptomatic and you right. have to be within six feet for 15 minutes without a mask, right. et cetera, et cetera. So everything we're doing is, in my opinion, well above and beyond, given the circumstances of our town. If our town had 5,000 people infected. I still feel safe with your plan because it is that, is that it's extensive, okay? But there's zero. So there's really no reason for the folks at home right now as of today to be worried. Now things can change. So we kept that in mind and we're adapting as we need to. Exactly. Right. And that's part of the plan. But I think a lot of there's a lot of fear in folks, at, you know, in general, in society. Uh, people are on edge over this for a lot of different reasons. Uh, some of it is true some of it is not true some of it's rumors it's just they're very fearful and i don't blame them they're going to send their you know, little kids to us right. um, sometime next month at you know, 15th or so okay. and and that's that's scary for a lot of folks right. um and especially if they don't know that there really isn't anything to be afraid of at right. least right now and, and i want i want to reiterate that because it's important for people to know that even though we have this place in place we have triage rooms and we have shields for kids to wear as of right now there is not one person testing positive in the town here right okay so if we can find a way to do better than that i'll let you know on how but i don't think we can so it may change next week right and i can i applaud you for all the work you've done um but people need to calm down a bit right and, and, and look at the data that we have here in our towns in front of us it does not matter what happens in boston or chicago right. or Georgia or Florida or anywhere else. The only thing that matters is our schools right. and how we do it. Right. And I think just to speak on the fear, um, I think the reason um, I believe in the beginning there was a lot of fear, and that is to be true and validated. And I'm not discrediting anybody's fear. Um, in the beginning, for the society basically for us to shut down is because it was so new and we did not have enough information to to be able to understand how it was spread. And yes, a lot of people talk about, you know, well, they've changed this, they've changed this, they've changed this, and masks were good, now they are good. The bottom line is, is it was a new virus that needed to be vetted, to be figured out by the CDC, how it was transmitted, how to stop the transmission. And masks were a big, uh, have been a big player recently since um, they instituted face coverings for everybody over the age of two. And it's not because they didn't know, but they also didn't want to take it from the healthcare workers. You wouldn't run, turn your firefighter and run him into a building that's burning without the appropriate PPE. The nurses and doctors were going to work without the appropriate PPE because there was a shortage. You wouldn't send your, your police officer into a gun battle without a bulletproof vest. So the, all the things, the culmination of things that changed with the face coverings was because we were able to, as a, as a country, hold together, produce the appropriate PPE, N95s for our hospital workers and staff, and then be able to say, okay, you want to want, you don't need a hospital grade mask or an N95, you need a face covering because a face covering is going to protect you from the droplets that expel from other people or that you may expel to prevent somebody from getting sick. And that, and, and that fear was real, but as, as we've evolved, we have more information. And now we know we don't need to shut everything down. We can open and pull back if we need to. That's why we have three plans, hybrid, full in-person, hybrid, and remote, depending on the situation. I don't disagree with you in the fact with the, with the mask. However, um, on a daily basis, the folks are bombarded with fear. And, you know, in the newspaper today, it says, you know, new guidelines for being outside with your friends at a cookout, you know, 
So there's a lot of conflicting information people are getting. Right. If it's not safe to have a, a beer and, and, and potato chips at a bar, why am I sending my kids to the school? Right. So regardless of why people are afraid, there's conflicting information coming from our leadership, right. and they've done a poor job helping us as an education, getting and encouraging folks to, to feel safe enough to send their kids back right. to school, and while at the same time undermining us right. with mixed messaging. Right. Well, I mean, I'm getting a little bit off topic, but it's very frustrating from my perspective because I get emails from folks who are terrified. Right. And legitimately so, because they're right. being told to be terrified every right. single day. Now, what I'm telling them is you have a great plan. It, it, it sounds like a great plan. There's no cases in our town. At least of right now, let's keep a close eye on all of this stuff and move forward. And hopefully the kids can get back to learning right. like they should. Right. Thank you, Frank. Um, Frank here. Hi. Um, thank you. First of all, what a great presentation. And um, I want to tell you I'm very grateful that you are our lead nurse heading up this program. Um, I, for one, believe that this virus is real. I believe that the tragic outcome is that, that people die. And, and that's not, you know, you can say that they had underlying diseases or uh, underlying symptoms, but at the same time, if someone's loved one, grandfather, aunt, uncle, parent, daughter, whatever it might be, dies two days, six months, two months before they could have or should have, then um, that's tragic. At the same time, I agree with a lot that is being said today. Um, if there's one thing I want to tell you about, and I have some questions, is that you have done, for me, and I don't know about anybody on this board, you take a leadership position in this district going forward. Um, just like we see our health directors in each town taking a leadership position where they set the rules and what they say goes. I want to tell you, whatever decision you make going forward, you have my 100% support. And I mean that because I think, um, I think people need to be put in a position and you have to be trusted to make those decisions and make hard choices and hard decisions going forward. So going forward, I can tell you right now, as someone who's sitting on this board, you will have my 100%, no matter what decision you make for our district. And I think that's important. And, and, it's, and if you don't get the audience that you need, then you need to come to us. And because I think, and that's no disrespect to anybody, but you're making decisions that are based on science and data that you have you have certifications for different than everybody else in this room and that we have to trust you so going forward i want you to know that um do you have everything you need in all the schools for us to come back to school do you have you know things to take temperature with are we having enough hand washing stations do we have enough hand sanitizer? Do we have? Do you have everything in the schools that you think you need going forward? So um, yes, and I've been working with Ken Jenks um, regarding PPE and to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, amount of PPE, whether it's full donning of um, uh, gowns or face masks or gloves, along with additional guidance um, that we have for staff or students that have forgotten their mask mm -hmm. or when it becomes visibly soiled. That they have the, uh, the ability to put a new one on during the school day. Um, we are working with the boards of health this week to make sure that our waiting room and our nurse's office are appropriate um, with running water and um, a bathroom um, for the kids that need to be in the medical waiting room waiting to be picked up from their families. I think we're in a good spot. I think there's things that we can still do. That we're still working on it, and, I, and I'm glad that we do have until um, the 16th before the kids walk in. I think that gives us an opportunity to not only educate um, the staff, but to really have that final walk through two, three days before school starts and be like, yeah, everything is where it needs to be. Everything is in place. We have the appropriate things that we need, um, as, as well as the communication going home to the parents um, and just really encouraging them to make sure um, that they are current on their physicals, they're current on their current immunizations, where, which are just as important um, because immunizations across the board are important, as well as current physicals and um, 
uh, uh, to be ready to, to, to receive them on the 16th with everything in place. Okay. So, and, and to go with that, if something comes up and you don't have what you need, mm -hmm. you need to email us. Okay. And, and you need to get to us. Because we, it's our responsibility to make sure Ken, Carol, and yourself have everything you need for our students to be safe and healthy in a learning environment. And I mean that. So, you know, going forward, I, I think this is an important issue. Um, I, you know, I agree with what Brian was talking about earlier about um, some of the fear that we've seen. We see, you know, I think every one of us at home in this room has seen the picture of the Georgia hallway of, you know. Nightmare. Right. Yep. Do you see that happening in our district? Um, I do not. I do okay. not. So let's repeat that. Right? <laughs> I do not. Okay. So we all seen the, the crappy picture of 100 people going down a hallway with nobody masks on. And do you see that happening at any grade level in our district? I do not because I know that in the Zoom calls that I have had and the meetings that I've had with the principals and like today, and I know with Dr. Paul Funk, I know that they are putting down arrows and everybody is only allowed to exit out of their room, I think to the right. And then they will actually have um, uh, strips down the hallway in the high school. I don't know if they're keeping the strips in the, the middle room. Yeah. In the, and they'll have a break so that if they had to make a U turn, they could without going all the way to the end. But everybody and dismissals, everything is planned out. And, you know, the first day of school is always kept it crazy anyway. Sure. You hope everyone gets on the wrong bus and a kindergartner doesn't get off the stop without a parent. Um, it does happen. Um, it happened to my child, but you know, fingers crossed. But with this, this is another layer that we're really trying to ensure to make sure that we are successful. And as I spoke to Carol and Ken, reopen with the things in place and we can add in cafeteria, we can add in ELA, we can add in. It's easier to add once we've been successful for two, three, four weeks than it is to turn around and pull back. You know. Slow and steady wins the race. Just because what other districts are doing doesn't mean we have to do it the same. We need to be thoughtful and planned out, and we can always add in after we've been successful after a week or two and kids get into a rhythm and a routine. Sure. Two last questions, and then I'll move on. Um, we've heard a lot about testing, and, and as far as on the Cape and within this geographical area, I know of, well, there's three testing sites that I know of. One is CareWell that does an instant test or a fairly instant test within 15, 20 minutes. The other one is Coastal Medical. Their procedure, uh, I believe, is 24 to 36 hours. I've heard that the Coastal Medical test is more accurate than the instant test. And there's also a testing site of the k Hospital. Hospital. Um, if you've already done it, that's great, but I think it's important that we have information ready for the most accurate test so that we can give that information out going forward. And if it changes next week, next month, I think that's important that we're ahead of that game planning for quote unquote the worst. And I don't want to say hoping for the best, but obviously it's something that we have to be prepared for. Right. So the PCR test is the most accurate test. And, and which one of those three is that one? That is um it, that is given that is done um, at Cape Cod Hospital and they can also do it at Carewell Urgent Care. Um, it usually takes about four to seven days for the results to come back, but that is the most accurate test is the PCR is the PCR test. Repeat that, please. The most accurate test is the PCR test. And it takes how long? It can take anywhere between four and seven days. Um, there are other tests that you can do. But they're not as accurate and for a student to come back i know some districts policies are that they have to have a negative pcr test to return to school that's where i was going that is the that is it's, that's usually take and you usually take the pcr test four to five days after your exposure that's when you more than likely if you were to have it you would have a positive test and then you would wait your seven days to get the results up to seven days Great, it's a pcr you. Yes. Yes. The last thing I have is I've spoken to both boards of health in terms of Dennis and Karen. They have, you have a 100% support going forward. They've talked to me, I've talked to them, they told me they've been in contact with you. They like the plan that you're moving forward with. They understand it's ever changing. And I appreciate the fact that you've been in touch with them so much. And I think that's something that we need to continue. Thanks very much. Thanks.
All right, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, just a couple of points of clarification, uh, Kristen, if you would. Um, is it that your recommendation is that the bathrooms are clean every time a student uses it? Um, every time a student uses the bathroom, they're going to be monitored and there's more than one um, bathroom area. There's more than usually one toilet in the bathroom. Um, frequent hand washing in use, doorknobs, handles, but the toilet doesn't necessarily have to be cleaned every single time, not every single person. I mean, females is a little bit different than males, mm -hmm. um, but you're really doing the high contact surface areas, the doorknobs, the door handles, the um, uh, uh, faucets, and, and if the, if the um, uh, paper towel holders are not the ones that automatically are sensor or pull down, sometimes they do have to turn them to advance them. That would be another area of contact that you'd want to want to so, watch because your hands technically are clean um, and you don't want to touch the handle on that. So if I were teaching first grade again and I sent little Johnny down to the restroom and he came back by himself without anybody watching him, um, as a teacher, would it be prudent to give him a little squirt of hand sanitizer yes. to sanitize his hand as he comes back into the Absolutely. classroom? And that would do it. And I wouldn't would have fine. to worry whether somebody had washed the bathroom, not washed the bathroom right. or the handles or whatever. Right. Because but that would be sufficient. Yes, because they're walking back into their environment and they will either wash their hands if there's a sink in there or they will use hand sanitizer before sitting at their desk. Right. And just for the committee's knowledge, um, we've talked a lot about things that we've been adding on and you know that there will be um, hand sanitizer pretty much everywhere um, and in every classroom. And um, we have also, uh, we have asked for a bid from our custodial company to um, purchase some additional cleaning hours um, during the day so that we can have people rotate around and keep cleaning those spaces. Um, doesn't mean that every single time a person walks into a bathroom and walks out that it's going to be clean because that's just, that would be impossible. That would be hiring a matron or someone for each restroom that we have in the, right. we could never, we couldn't function that way. We wouldn't have any money left for anybody to be teachers or assistants. The only um, caveat to that would be our medically fragile where you're right. actually laying someone down and diapering doing catheterizations um, or your pre-K um, daycare student who has an accident and you're actually changing that child in the bathroom, then that would be clean because the child that have diarrhea or vomit, those, those would be your um, times that you would, would really want to go back in and clean. But those are not your, your normal day toilet use right. for the general population. And in those programs that we had this summer, we had some of those students. Yep. And we trained the staff and that was working was with the students and it was successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, nothing more on this. Topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an information item, which is just the new school calendar. And now we are going to have a public comment period. A policy on public participation in meetings is found here on the table. It's also, we also have all our policies available online. The public is reminded that a school committee meeting is a meeting of a governmental body, which members of the body deliberate over public business. We welcome your attendance and appreciate your interest in you and your school committee as we conduct our regular business meeting. Some questions you may have may not be within the scope of our responsibilities. In that case, I suggest you send your question writing to the appropriate person. You may address topics on the agenda, items specified for public comment, or items within the scope of responsibility of the committee. Each citizen will be allowed to speak for no more than three minutes, and we are doing half an hour of Public comment, we're running a little late, so public comment will go from now until 20. And so if you'd like to be recognized, you raise your hand on the Zoom and Carl will recognize you and then you will have three minutes to speak. Okay, first person with their hand up is Maureen Kessler. 
good evening. Thank you all for being here um, at the at this really important meeting. I'm I'm a resident of Yarmouth for 25 years. I um, sent both of my children through the district and have taught at the high school level for 20 years. So some additional things I would like you to consider regarding opening in person are just a few things like the inequity that some high school teachers that teach four classes will then have four cohorts and four times the exposure. In the high school, we're expected to have students eat twice a day in our classrooms. That's two times a day, breakfast and lunch. Can they socialize when they're eating? Are we supposed to teach them how to not speak with food in their mouth? Um, and then again, I'd also like you to consider the great concern for our student social and emotional learning. You know, we care so much about that. It's really important, but has anyone considered the emotional toll on teachers who may have to be quarantined more than once? I thank you for considering this and um, thank you. Michelle Dunn. Good evening, I'm Michelle Dunn, fifth grade teacher at Wixon, president of the association. I was glad to hear Mr. Carey say that you oh, guys yes. would be responsible for providing everything we need. One thing we need is inspection reports for the HVAC systems for our schools. On the 3rd of July, we submitted an information request for those reports. We have not received them because the inspections have not happened. The last time I asked Mr. Jenks about this, he assured me that as soon as they were scheduled, he would let me know so to my knowledge, that was last Thursday. They have not yet been scheduled. Every day that passes is another less day that we have to fix any problems that those HVAC inspections uncover. And our district has spent many, many years applying for MSBA funds. My guess is that in the applications that we have submitted to MSBA, we have talked about how inefficient and outdated and unfixable our HVAC systems are. And we will be submitting a 150E request what the heck? For that we submitted to the MSBA. But I know going as far back as 2017, the company that we hired to work with us on our applications has stated that our HVAC systems are lacking. We cannot expect students and staff to be in the buildings until we have reports that say that the HVAC systems are working and are functioning to the level that we need in the era of a pandemic. And until all of the problems that are uncovered by those inspections are rectified. So I would like to ask the committee to help move forward on getting those inspections done promptly. Um, it seems like a month is a long way away. A month is not a long way away. And our staff is going to be coming in for professional development and planning much sooner than September 16th. Thank you. I'm going to take a moment and have Ken Jenks respond on the the long and the short of it, I didn't get confirmation until yesterday after uh, today afternoon that the inspections start tomorrow. They're a professional firm. We went to the state list because we felt that I understand working with someone who might not be an independent agency or wasn't under contract with any years. And so that was the earliest we could get them in. They actually start tomorrow. We'll be physically in buildings. I believe they'll be at the high school first. And as soon as we get the reports, we'll submit them. The association, as Ms. Dunn pointed out, has asked for that. And we said, yes, we're working with the county. We have our own internal things. But this was trying to get them because we're paying them in the contract to do a thorough report. And I wish it could have happened a little sooner, but that's when we could get them in because several weeks ago, we had the reality is there's not a lot of engineers just waiting to do the reports, so we'll have that information. I don't want to underestimate the internal pieces we've done that are on the report, e, e the HVAC consultant firm, Lots New England works with us multiple days a week. So we'll have the assessment and the issue really came down to not just saying how many times did certain kinds of uni events of certain age turn over the air in a room, but let's do each room by an engineer so we can have those results. Thank you very much. Are there any public comments? Hudson Graham. 
Judson. Good evening. Thank you. Judson Graham, I am a resident of Dennis. I'm the parent of three high school students and I'm a teacher at Wixon. I have a, a short comment to make and that is, I take great umbrage in a school committee member saying that we will all be safe. We, the teachers, the students, the staff, no one knows that for certain. And that's not to say that we're not taking measures to try and ensure that. But I don't think it is appropriate for anyone to say that they will all be safe. That's all, thank you. I don't see any other hands. Oh, Kelly Renzi. Kelly Renzi. Hello, how are you guys tonight? I do have a couple questions. Like Judson, I work at Wixon. Um, I also have a 12 year old daughter that I'm concerned about being in the community with children who aren't as clean as we all seem to feel they are. But um, I'm concerned with the comparison of wearing a mask to the bulletproof vest. Um, so you're basically saying that we are putting our children into a place that they need to wear something to save their lives. Is that, that's how I took that. Um, I don't think that you can compare a mask to a bulletproof vest, especially if a five-year-old is wearing it. And we all know that five-year-olds won't keep them on. But my other comment is um, hair salons. Somebody compared teachers going into the classroom and students going in to hair salons. Well, hair salons don't see 14 people at once or as some of our related arts teachers will see a hundred students a day. So you can't compare a classroom to a hair salon. It's just, that's apples to oranges. Um, I'm very concerned with the cleanliness. I know we talked about this last time before we were cut off. Um, the HVAC systems are so disgusting. Um, mine, my partner's room is being held up by a pipe cleaner. And, and we have put in our um, school dude things. Um, I just feel that this is, we are acting um, not responsibly here. We are. And if we're doing all this on Zoom calls and if we're doing professional development on Zoom calls, why are we sending these children in? Thank you very much. Is there anyone else trying to get hand up? I don't think I see one more, Aaron Porter. Aaron Porter. Hi, um, thank, you, thank you, Carol. Um, Aaron Porter, I'm a teacher at Station Avenue Elementary School. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm hearing all kinds of information and I appreciate the presentation. Um, that I thought that was very helpful. Um, what we're hearing is that hand washing, hand sanitizing, um, having those resources available for children is, and for teachers as well, is of utmost importance for all of our health and safety. I'm wondering about the students who are going to be housed in the gyms, um, where there's large numbers of kids um, housed, will there be running water and soap available for those students? Um, will there be partitions between the groups, the cohorts within those large spaces? And is there a way to keep the airflow contained within the cohorts of children? Or will that airflow be going throughout those entire large spaces? And how is that safe for students and for staff? Thank you. Is there anyone else with their hand raised? I don't see anyone else. How, this, this is Vita oh, Morris. Can I? Uh, oh, wait a minute. Go ahead, Vita. I'll get you next, Miss. All right. Um, uh, uh, you know, I can't tell you how upset I was about the uh, 
uh, with the unions uh, uh, hijacking uh, the uh, uh, public comment meeting at the last uh, meeting there. And, and uh, obviously it was all organized, and uh, they had absolutely no statistics, no data, nothing. They just uh, uh, had uh, practiced what to say, and it was pretty much repeating uh, the same thing, same thing all over again. Uh, and uh, 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 obviously whimpering and whining and instilling more fear, if any of the younger people were listening, it, it was uh, really uh, very, very upsetting. And they, uh, you could tell they, they, they didn't pay any attention to whatever statistics were presented to them uh, 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 at the beginning of the meeting uh, and uh, disregarded them completely. Uh, I just, uh, do they realize that uh, uh, the children are suffering psychological damage? And that's uh, universally agreed to. And some of them, if this continues, if they don't get back to the schools, it could become irreparable damage. Uh, and they, they better think about that uh, very carefully. Now, uh, the, uh, this business of nitpicking and, and uh, you know, how fearful they are to return to, to their uh, jobs, uh, what, uh, what do they think of people who are manning the um, uh, stop and shops of this country, for example? What if they pull the same stunt? Uh, on, on all of us, then everybody would be dead, including all of you, uh, and it wouldn't be from the coronavirus. It would be from hunger. Now, but, uh, life is such that we, uh, you know, we take chances every time we step out the door, and even under so-called normal circumstances. And what has been presented here uh, at uh, last week and, and uh, today uh, uh, should be uh, giving you uh, comfort that everything is be, humanly possible is being done to, to uh, 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 you know, protect the children and the teachers, and we need to move on and stop, stop with the whining and the, without any information or anything like that and, and uh, uh, in, instilling any, even more fear in, in the parents and, and, and children who might be listening. Uh, that, uh, I, I just hope that this will continue to progress as it has so far. I think so far the, the uh, administration and the uh, committee have done the right job. Thank you. Okay, we have another person. Uh, yes. The name on the screen is Tom. Is Thomas Houston? Hi. Yes, it's um, his wife Kelly Houston. Um, I have a child at Wixon and I have a child at Station, and I also teach at Sturgis. Um, my question is, there's so much information happening. Is it possible to create an FAQ page for parents and teachers? Because um, there's a lot of info flying. I know there's a lot of things that are changing. I'm hearing a lot of rumors. It's hard to really make decisions without having solid information like in print. So I'm wondering if we can create that. And then my second question, if I can ask one, is what's the tipping point in terms of the entire school going remote? Um, how many how many people in the building have to be suspected of COVID or be tested positive in, in order for the entire school to go remote? Um, I, I think while we have Kristen here, I swear I'm yep. trying to respond to that question. Mm -hmm. um, and we're Kristen, we're, I want to. We are working on that thank you page. But, for the parents, right, I was so. going to say there's a. We're actually putting the whole plan on a very specialized page, so there could be an FAQ added to it. Right. Kristen, I remember from one of the task force meetings that there was no magic number for closing, but there is part of your... Um, they're not, it's, it's not a specific number. Uh, it can be a percentage or beyond one cohort or a small number of cohorts within a school and district leaders would then consult with the local boards of health for the proposed next steps. Um, should there be circumstances where there are multiple cases in multiple schools within the school district, leaders then will consult with the local boards of health, both Dennis and Yarmouth, and then before the final decision is made for a district closure, the superintendent would then talk with Desi, um, with Russell Johnson and Eric McMahon, would then it would, it would be escalated to that point. But it first would be at a local level, it would be at a school, you know, a pod level, then at a school level, and then if it was a district level, it would just continue to escalate. And then based on that, it would make the determination to close. Thank you, Kristen. Yep. Anyone else who can um, Bridget Britton. Yeah, 
present. You unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Bridget Britton. I am an art teacher at Wixon. I have taught 12 years in the district and I have spent the last five months protecting this bubble that the governor has suggested for us. And my family has gone nowhere. We have done nothing. And in a matter of weeks, I am expected to go into the classroom and be exposed to not just one cohort, but as many as four cohorts, maybe plus, depending on how many students um, come back to us, and plus teachers. And I am very, very terrified and scared for my family and scared for what is going to happen to me. I'm prepared to wear the appropriate PPE that I purchased myself. And I'm worried for the dispersing and collecting of materials because as I heard um, at the beginning, um, everything has to be sanitized and left out. And that is not really a possibility for what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm just at a loss of what my job entails. Um, so I'm just, I, I guess I'm just in limbo right here of what my responsibilities are for sanitizing and what I am going to be um, given to in regards to that. So thank you very much. Anyone else? I don't see anyone else. All right. I guess that concludes our public comment. Um, we have a motion to enter into executive sessions. Jen, right. Dennis Hammond's Regional School Committee will enter into the executive session, not to return to public session for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position, of the public body and the chair so declares DYDA negotiations, DYRSAA negotiations. Aid and seconded. Roll call vote. Joe Glenn? Aye. Bill Morris? Yes. Brian yes. Yes. Jim Dykeman? Yes. Brian yes. Curry, Joe Tierney? Yes. And on the end. Thank you. That concludes the public portion of this meeting. Thank you very much, Kristen. Thank you, Chris. Nice job. I'm not saying that this is the same thing as a bowl.